Hi, this is Jenna Lynn Wright. I am the co-creator of Cult of Icarus and Lady Mayhem, as well as the writer of various Xenoscope quarterlies. You can find me at www.jenalynwright.com, and this is Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic creator and writer. She's written many comics that I'll let her describe because I don't think I would do it ever any justice whatsoever. We're joined today by the ever talented Jenna Lynn Wright, who is the creator of Cult of Icarus and Lady Mayhem. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I know you have a, a very talented artist that works with you, and he's unfortunately un un unable to make it. Who's the artist that's worked on your, your work so far? Uh, his name is Carl Slominski, and he is the co-creator of Cult of Icarus and the co-creator of Lady Mayhem, as well as having his own projects because he can draw, write, letter, color. He's, he's a one-man band. If anything, I'm writing his coattails. <laughs> For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, of course, Cult of Icarus and Lady Mayhem, tell us who you are and what those comics are all about. I started out in screenwriting. I am still a screenwriter and then transitioned into writing books and comics. I got much more into comics when uh, Carl and I met up. Our first project together is Cult of Icarus, and it is a four-issue miniseries that is coming out through Scout Comics. And it is about a foster kid who goes searching for answers about her birth parents and stumbles upon a parallel world, the par world parallel to ours, that is full of uh, nightmare creatures such as vampires, witches, all of that. And she finds out she may be more than human and possibly a harbinger of the apocalypse. It's very bright. It's been described as a little bit punk rock, a little bit gritty, something you might find on the CW, except for it's a little bit more adult than that. So maybe HBO. <laughs> Lady Mayhem is a complete 180 from that. It is a 90s style, like image revenge comic of just, it's a basically Lady Punisher. I came home one day and was like, I want to do Lady Punisher. And I think we have to call her, I think it was Molly Mayhem. And he was like, no, we have to call her Lady Mayhem. And this is how it's going to be. And I'm going to steal this idea. You can write it with me if you want to. <laughs> Got to love collaborations when it comes to creative people. It's always amazing what you can find and what you can create as well, too. Being co-creators of both of these series, and, and they are truly amazing here. World building, I think, is always amazing because you never know how a world is going to be shaped just from a few conversations. So how did the world of Cult of Icarus come about, and, and what themes spoke to you in that world? It started out as a title. Carl had the title. And we built it out from there. And we were going to create our own mythological creature and build up it from the ground up, from scratch. And we spent a while trying to do that. And then we were coming home from C2E2 a few years ago, talking about it, brainstorming. And we just said, why don't we make it easy on our lives? It's Cult of Icarus. It clearly has something to do with the sun. Let's make them vampires. Everyone has a shorthand for vampires everyone knows what's up with vampires. And sure, it's ground that's been trod before, but not in the way that we're doing it because everyone brings their own voice to a project. We went from there. And so I am always a huge fan of like something that's 5% off of reality. I love the idea of there being a parallel world that runs along our own. They're, they're here right next to us, these creatures, and you just don't know it or you just don't see it. Uh, a lot of stuff in my film, my filmmaking career is... 5% supernatural or 5% weird. We built it from there. We really ran with the vampire mythos and like what we could do to bring our own spin to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go kind of a two-part here because you're, you're a filmmaker and, and a screenwriter as well as a comic writer as well too. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a, a screenwriter and being a comic writer? I think the most misunderstood thing about being a screenwriter is that anyone can do it because we all can write. And I don't mind it, but people will come up and say, oh my gosh, I have the best idea for a script. I don't have the time to write it, but you should really do this. And I wanna say, I have the same amount of time in a day as you do. 
And I studied for years on like, I read, I read thousands of scripts. I've listened to podcasts. I've studied what works and what doesn't. And I've learned the rules so that I can break them. And to say, I'd write a movie. I just don't have the time. It is not how that works. It's inch by inch. You kind of claw your way up in the business. And I think that because a lot of people read and a lot of people write, they think I can write a screenplay. I can write a book. And I'm sorry, but unless you are the number one most gifted person on the planet, you cannot do that. And with comic writing, I think that the number one most uh, misunderstood thing is that I will say it's easier than writing scripts. Like mm. to, for me, you have the artist to make you look good. Like even if you're not great at what you do, hopefully you're working with an artist who can take what you're doing and make it look spectacular. And guess what? You're going to get all the credit because <laughs> these days the the focus I feel like in comics journalism and in, you know, the who have become the comic superstars, it really is focused on the writer, whereas it used to be the artist. But I think it's misunderstood in comic writing that it's easy for, for that too. Like I say, it's easier than screenwriting, but you got to know the fundamentals. You want to end on a page turn. You can only put one action in a panel. You really have to study the craft. I feel like that's what it comes down to with both of them is just because you can write a sentence doesn't mean you can write a comic or you can write a, a script. It's a lot harder than that. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. I just... No, 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 no. no. You're, you're, you are perfectly fine. Please, tangents are, are what was made this show last for 14 years. So I'm okay with that <laughs> by all means. So don't feel like you need to cut yourself short or anything like that. What's the hardest part then, at least in your current journey, when it came to writing Cult of Icarus and Lady Mayhem, was it the beginning, the middle, or the end part of the process? It is the beginning. I love brainstorming. I love research. I love vomiting ideas down on the page and then whittling them down into what's actually good and what's not at all because a lot of it's crap. I think my favorite part is the beginning, but that's also the hardest part. When I was writing the first issue of Cult of Icarus, that was one of the first things in comics I'd ever written, if not the first thing. It was rough. It was really rough. And that was what was so helpful. I mean, aside from Carl making it look good was he's studied comics. I mean, he's wanted to be a cartoonist since he was six. He came at it with this wealth of knowledge that I was lucky enough to kind of just soak it all up like a sponge. And he'd be like, he read my first script. And he was like, here's where you went off the rails here. Here's what you can't do here. There's not a page turn here. You could combine this here. The leaps that I made from issue one to issue two, and then two to three, and then four was a blast. Were kind of extraordinary for me to see just how much I didn't know in the beginning compared to um, what I was doing at the end. And then by that time, I had also started writing for Zenoscope, and that was a boot camp in and of itself. As long as you're hungry to learn and as long as you kind of are open to soaking up everything that you can and not being precious about what you do, you, you can get good. I like to think that I'm good uh, <laughs> uh, in a relatively quick period of time. You just have to be open to learning. So then as these scripts came together, what was the scene that you wrote that when you finally saw the art for it, you were blown away by it? Uh, <laughs> spoilers for issue two, although it's out on stands, so not really spoilers. But my favorite thing was when I wrote that a vampire minion, um, the main vampire, ripped his spine out for insolence. <laughs> uh, I just said, he's going to get a spine ripped out. And Carl was like, oh, I can do that. I can do that real nice. It comes toward the end of issue two. And when I saw it, the line art was, I mean, it's weird to say, but it was beautiful. And then I saw it colored and it was even better um, because of the, the bright, vivid reds. And, and it was, there's a moment in each book where we get very violent and it's always my favorite. Like in issue one, a, a guy gets staked and his face peels off and it looks great. So yeah, the violent stuff. <laughs> All right. What was it? I, I had an interview one time where a comic writer was saying they were very short with their dialogue because they wanted to showcase the art. People are there yeah. to see the art specifically. Yet, yet you said that at least nowadays, comic writers are are the kind of the A list stars. I'm not uh, the feature. Yeah, stars. yeah. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> why do you, why do you think that is? Is it public perception? Is it just the way times have changed? I this might be an unpopular opinion. But I think it's because I think that 
a lot of companies think that artists might have too much power because like I said, a lot of people think they can write and a lot of people do write. Not a lot of people can draw, can draw in a spectacular way that's not just a pretty picture, but that is a narrative device. Like you should be driving the story on every page. It's not just here's a pretty lady or here's a great landscape. And I think that once the guys left to found image because they didn't feel like they were being treated well, the industry shifted into well, we can't let that happen again. They have too much power. We need to focus on the people that can only do one thing. And by the way, that I mean, how many times have you seen in the big two artists who are doing really stellar work get kicked off a project after four or five issues to bring in somebody new? And it's like, people loved what they were doing. Why are you doing that? Is because we don't want them to get too entrenched. We don't want them to get too much attention. Let's focus on the people that we can kind of put under contract and a little bit control. And listen, I... I don't work for the big two. So that might not be true, but that is the impression that I get. And that being said, I'm open to work for the big two. I'm not mad. Like you can hire me, <laughs> but I, I do think that it's, they're worried about a, a revolution like that happening again, because I do think that without the art, it's not a comic. And so you got it there. I think they want to keep artists in their place, their place. Which is why I think a lot of creators nowadays are just going independent and saying, you know, screw the big two, screw the big yeah. three type deal. It's like, we can create our own thing. We don't need major publishers anymore. It's true. Especially, yeah, with Kickstarter and everything. And then when you see all these stories come out with Marvel, the, the creators of certain characters don't get paid when they hit the big screen in any sort of meaningful way. And like, yes, of course, they knew that going in that Marvel would own the characters and whatnot. But at the same time, you'll see images in these movies ripped straight from the comic. Yeah. They get nothing. And so why wouldn't you take your talents to a place where you'd be appreciated or, you know, just going on your own because you're going to have a fan base for sure. So what is your creative kryptonite? Oh, my creative kryptonite. This is going to sound so silly, <laughs> but <laughs> well, number one, it's social media. I hate social media. <laughs> and I feel like in this day and age, you've been told that you have to be on social media to promote yourself. But I know very few people, very few people who have landed any sort of meaningful job because they hit up a creator on, on Twitter. And maybe that's different in comics. It definitely really doesn't happen in film. Procrastinating and then hopping onto social media and losing 15 minutes when I could have lost two if I'd just gotten up and gotten a drink of water. And number two is actually beverages. Like I am one of these weird writers who when I sit down at a desk, I have like a glass of water, a tea, like a coffee, maybe a beer. Like I have like five beverages and that is, I need, I just need them. It's like a weird crutch. So that's, that's my kryptonite. Yeah. I was going to say, I, uh, I went back to school for visual arts and film. So I, I was a producer, editor, all that other stuff as well. Yeah. Too. I still do all that stuff. Yeah. This. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that was one thing when, when I was learning the, the creative side of, of art uh, from painting and, and all that other stuff, I would see p people similar to yourself. So it's not an uncommon aspect. What was weird was when they would dip their paintbrush into their coffee and accidentally <laughs> take, try and take a sip of it. Type of exactly. Exactly. You got to be so careful with those, those cups. Have, have it like a different color just to make sure that, you know, you're. you're yes. Active. Red is the, the paint cup. Leave that alone. <laughs> what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? That's a good question there was an instance um, where I was working with a producer and it took years. Like I started writing a film over 10 years ago and we were working with a producer and I had always been a little bit of a pushover. Um, I'm always one to not rock the boat. I'm always one to do all the notes without much kind of pushback. We were working on developing a script and we had gotten it to a point where we thought that it was going to be good to go and we we're going to try to sell it. Someone that we were working with on it came back, decided they wanted to change the second half <laughs> of the entire thing. And we had already worked for free for years. Uh, I have a writing partner when I say we, for free for years in trying to get this thing into shape. When we were on the phone, producer we were speaking with said, oh, you know, they want to change the second half of the script. And something inside of me just snapped. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, 
no, we're, you know, even at the risk of losing this project, like I had not really ever used my voice before. It was simplest word was just no. And to my shock and awe, the producer was like, okay, I'll let him know. Like, and it wasn't an issue. And from that moment forward, my career took an, a 180. I was never scared to speak up for myself again, because even in the worst case scenario, I was ready to walk away. Like, don't sit down at a table you can't walk away from, right? I had finally gotten to the point where I was willing to walk away and I stood up for myself and the best case scenario happened. So that was when I realized just because you're the writer, I always tell Carl, the writer in film is like the artist in comics. The superstars of film are the directors. The superstars of comics seem to be writers. So if you want to get walked all over, be a screenwriter or be a comic artist. And when you speak up for yourself, understand that you are the talent. They can't do this without you and your voice matters. Like you said, many people just want to get through their job, still be creative, but get through their job with as little drama as possible yet. I was going to say, this is a career that so many people love with their whole heart. And like, this is what they're calling. It's what they're meant to do. Nobody gets into a career where there's no financial security, <laughs> no health insurance, like, like nothing. You're, you're really putting yourself out there. So it means a ton to you. So to, to use your voice and speak up is very scary because this can be taken away from you. And it's the only thing you want to do. That's another reason why I love crowdfunding um, for people, especially people who can do it all, because nobody can tell you, no, it's yours. You can do whatever you want. I always found namology fascinating when it comes to the creation of characters, because it kind of gives you a, a brief glimpse of, of the mindset of, of a, a creative people. And the fact that you have both of yourselves as co-creators, I'm sure there was a lot of volleyballing back and forth of certain names or whatever, but, but how did you come up with some of the names of, of your characters? I am a huge fan of baby name websites. For a lot of the vampire characters, we wanted to find old timey names because these were going to be people that were hundreds of years old. So to name someone, Michaela wouldn't fit, you know? So a lot of times it's stuff like that. It will also be, if you're writing a werewolf story, maybe you will Google words for moon or words for wolf. And then you'll like kind of cobble together um, a name that way. But naming characters is half the fun. And I have found that I cannot write a character until I know their name. Like I can't create a persona for someone until I know what to call them. Sometimes that can take hours <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out what I'm going to call somebody. And sometimes I will have an idea and the name will pop into my head like that. Uh, Hunter is the main character in Icarus, and that just made sense because, I mean, we always think about vampire hunters. She's not one, but yeah, we have characters like Caleb and Hazel, and it's like they're all old school type type stuff, and that's oh, baby names, huge, huge. Oh, if you want a Curtis or a Kurt, I'll be happy to. Name, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. That that was something that was really driven into me from from the university for film. It was you can't create a script without at least naming your characters first because you don't know the paths your characters are going to be. And a Bill or a William is completely different than a Joe or a Sally or whatever. Yeah. When I'm outlining, I can't write. So our, our protagonist, blah, blah, blah. It just, it feels so cold and impersonal. I need to be like, okay, so Lucy does this and that so much easier for me instead of man one woman one. exactly <laughs> our hero our yeah. antagonist like it just it doesn't work for me uh, filmmaking and, and writing and script writing is something i've been dabbling with for for a while now and you know there's something about a pilot that if you get in that zone and you, you put together a pilot and it's just like certain scenes kind of just stick out with you it's like this is why i love doing what i'm doing oh gosh yeah absolutely like you said with the scenes in the comics they were my favorite Sometimes with scripts, I will only have an idea of like what the general thing will be. And then like two scenes that I was like, okay, to be in there. And then you just have to go, you know, kind of connect everything. I will, I have to write in sequence, but when I'm outlining, I will definitely bop back and forth between the end and the beginning. Because sometimes if you know where you're going, you can backtrack and connect everything that way. And that's easy. Sometimes you get lost in, in the flow as well, too. And it's like, okay, uh, these are the points I need to reconnect to. Exactly. I've gotten a little bit off the beaten path here. Let's bring it on back around. <laughs> How did Frankenstein show up in this? I have no idea. But You know, that's the thing. A lot of times my writing partner, sometimes when I let him outline, I'm the continuity person because <laughs> he will come back 
and he'll be like, so Steve shows up in scene 42. And I'm like, well, you killed Steve in scene 27. So <laughs> I'm going to need you to fix that. But it's like Hamlet. He's an apparition. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know. And listen, I do a lot of supernatural stuff. So that's a possibility. Okay. Film is infiltrating comics on, <laughs> on all ends. Or sometimes vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although I think we might be coming toward the end of that. I feel like they've mined almost as much as possible. It depends on how saturated the market is these days. I mean, it's extremely saturated, I'm sure. Very saturated. When it comes to Uh, then, editing uh is sometimes the bane of people's existence. Other times people thrive in the editing room, so to speak, when it comes to film and comics. Um, What did you edit out of the book? Almost nothing. The issue that that we did the most editing on was issue three. Um, But I want to say that Number one needed to be rewritten because I was still getting my sea legs underneath me in terms of the style of comic writing. And then issue two, I lied. Issue two was the one that needed the most rewriting. There was an entire sequence in the middle where we realized that it was just killing time. It was just too much in one place, not really adding a lot to the story. I find that a lot of comics I read these days are a lot of people in rooms talking, which is hard enough to make interesting in film where there's motion and sound. In comics, unless you are writing like Grant Morrison style dialogue, it's sometimes a slog to get through. And so Carl and I really prioritized having different locations, keeping people moving, keeping the tension up, keeping the information like getting dribbled out. So you'd have to keep going. The pacing was super, super important to us. And we had initially actually we had initially planned for five issues of Icarus. And we realized in the plotting that we could get rid of a lot of fat and just kind of do all killer, no filler if we did four issues. And Scout, to their credit, was like, yeah, great, sounds perfect. Like, just do four, get in and get out and tell a really tight, awesome story. And so that's what we did. We hate the idea of, of padding anything just to get an extra issue out of it. Seeing as you're, you're in both worlds of comic and film, I'm sure mm-hmm. you've thought of Icarus being a feature or maybe a series of some kind. Who would play yeah. some of the characters that you would think would be awesome? Oh, my goodness. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Who do I love? (laughs) (laughs) I think that when we were envisioning it, we said, if this were to be something, we figured it might go for television more than film. It just seems to lend itself to an extended serialized type story. I mean, comics are serialized to begin with. But to be honest, getting something made like that is so tough, like so tough. To even fan cast it never crossed our minds because we were just like, we want this to be a good comic first. But I'm trying to think some things I've loved lately. You know what? I can't even tell you because we haven't even thought of it. I cannot think of a single person that I would cast in this because I know how difficult it is to actually get anything made. And I just, it would be uh, like, it's almost beyond my comprehension. (laughs) I'm sure everyone's thought of turning their comic into something and the fact that you have that intimate knowledge of it would be interesting i would trust the casting directors on it i'm sure that they know plenty of amazing people that i'm sure i would uh, be thrilled to have on there casting directors hit me up i'm ready to ready to talk in terms of films what's your most unappreciated film that people should watch and the same for comics mm, i know for comics It was very well appreciated, I believe, while it was running. And then it came to an end, which made me very sad, which was, and I've said this on other podcasts, but I I just cannot get past this run of comics, is uh, Cy Spurrier's run on Constantine. Mm -hmm. Um, That was one of the only comics that I've ever put on a pull list and like would not miss. I thought it was brilliant. And I thought the art on it was brilliant. And it was just 100% everything I wanted in a comic book. Um, And I love John Constantine as a character. And I was always like, if I ever get to work for DC, I want to write John Constantine. I don't anymore because I'm not going to do better than that. For film, one of both mine and Carl's favorite movies of the last five years that I feel like not enough people have seen uh, is a movie called Bliss. Mm -hmm. And it is a uh, a pseudo-vampire movie, but it is about a woman who is a fine artist who has lost her mojo a little bit. And she's not a incre- she's not a likable character. I mean, she's basically on drugs and kind of late on her rent. And um, she goes to a party. And then the night after the party, 
she starts to change and she starts to kind of lose time, but her art is becoming better and better. And she slowly realizes that she has been bitten and now craves blood. And it's very like neon and the music is like rock music. And it's, we watched it kind of sitting there with our mouths hanging open because it was such a perfect metaphor. Like anyone who's a, an artist who is driven a little bit mad by wanting to get on the page, what you have in your head and feeling like you, you never get there. You just try to do your best and then kind of losing it. <laughs> like it, it's this, it's, I'm not selling it very well, but if you are an artist or a writer or a creative of any kind, and you want to see just like a bonkers, pseudo horror, kind of gory, very awesome movie. It's called Bliss and it was directed by Joe Bagos and he wrote it as well. And I believe that he wrote it after he fired his agents and managers and was so frustrated with the movie making process that he was like, I'm just going to do this by myself. I'm going to make it by myself. And it's about my artistic struggles. <laughs> it's brilliant. I, it's one of my favorite movies the last five years for sure. You know, I also want to give a shout out. I just watched a movie last night mm -hmm. um, called This Changes Everything. And as someone who writes screenplays, but also I want to move into directing as well. It is a documentary funded by the Gina Davis Institute for like gender equality. Nice. And it tells the story of how um, women have been like systemically <laughs> left out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched it and you know, you have all these, these luminaries. There's like Natalie Portman and mm -hmm. Kate Blanchett and all these people speaking, but it really goes into the history and how things came to be. And like the progress you make, it's like, one step forward, two steps back. And I just sat there and like in a rage, but also like so inspired to then just make all of the things. Um, I would recommend it to creative women. I would also recommend it to creative men to um, understand how unconscious bias happens and then um, do what you can to kind of make things 50-50. It's a phenomenal documentary made by a man about women and it was awesome something i'll have to put on my uh my watch list for sure it's really good really good is there anything i haven't asked you or, or anything you'd like to touch upon that you'd like to showcase those who are watching and listening to this interview no this has been great so far it's very freewheeling and and uh your questions lead into other things which is really nice so yeah no you this is great do you believe in writer's block not have you had writer's block no, I don't. <laughs> I think uh, writer's block or what we think of as writer's block comes about because you have not thought through your story enough before you sat down to, to write pages. If you, I know that not everyone outlines and I used to be somebody who does not outline and that was a huge mistake. All writing is great and I hate to say it's wasted time, but you go down a lot of roads to dead ends that you might not have done if you had just sat down and even spent 20 minutes trying to think about, here's my end, how am I gonna get there? I say, if you're having writer's block, I think you're just having, I didn't plan out my story block. Step away from final draft or word or whatever it is that you're working on. Get a pen, pencil, and a piece of paper. It always works for me. When you slow down and write it out by hand, your brain will start to um, get ahead of how fast you can write. So you'll start thinking of these ideas and you'll have to slow down to write them out. And then you'll start thinking of new questions, and new avenues. And before you know it, you will probably have something way mo more coherent than you did even 15 minutes ago. Please outline with a pen and paper. You do not have writer's block. You just need to take a little bit more time. And, and I, I also want to say, sure. this is, I mean, this is clearly all stuff that has worked for me and it might not work for everyone. Please take with a grain of salt. I'm just trying to be helpful. Please don't yell at me on Twitter. At what point are we good? No. Hmm. My first instinct is to say never. I feel like stuff I write comes out and I eventually get it to a place that I'm very happy with, that I would be happy to show anyone as a proud example of my work. I'm always shocked when somebody comes back with a note and I think to myself, I, I should have seen that coming. That is 100% a great note. And here I was thinking I had my story perfect. I mean, I think that all creators are narcissists at heart. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean to believe that other people should spend time on something you made up in your brain. You have to have a bit of ego. If you feel like you're not good enough, understand that that just means that you're 
an artist. You, you want to be good at what you do. And anybody who walks into the room and says, this is it. I've learned all I can learn. That's somebody you want to stay away from. What in life is beautiful to you? I think there is nothing more beautiful than one, a day where I feel good about my work because I didn't realize I was one of these arty types who is just a complete crab if I don't, I feel like I didn't do good work that day. It needs to flow. I need to feel like I accomplished something. I'm very hard on myself. I feel the ticking of the clock in like my own mortality. I have since I was in my early 20s. I was just like, there's never enough time. I'm never going to get all this done. And this is even before I was a writer. Beauty to me is the peace that I feel when I've had a good writing day or a good even learning day. If I'm reading a book about directing or, or watching the behind the scenes of a DVD, it's all work to me and it all counts. And I think, you know, not to get too sappy, but the creative relationship that I um, developed with Carl that then became a romantic relationship, I feel very lucky that I found someone who is like this creative force of nature gets me to be better. I hope that I try to get him to be better. And like we kind of grow and learn and change and it's never boring. It's always fun. It's always exciting. And like, we're both genuinely enthusiastic about what the other person is doing. And I I never saw that for myself. I was kind of like, I'm going to be this, you know, cranky old writer forever. And I'm just going to be a spinster in my attic, like (laughs) typing out manuscripts. It's beautiful to me, this kind of dynamic that we have. It's, it's just the best. But what is one thing you wish to accomplish before you die? Since morality or mortality, I should say, is, is an ever ticking clock. I want to direct horror movies and like, I'll do thrillers. I'll do psychological thrillers. I will do sci-fi, but like my first love is horror. My number one guy is John Carpenter. Mm. Um, I want to make my Halloween, I guess, is my answer because I love screenwriting. But like I said, uh, writers are f- the first people to get chucked to the side in screenwriting. And I would love to have more control of my creative destiny. So I want to start directing movies and I want to have, if I only get one before I die, I suppose that'll be a success, but it won't be enough for me. It actually sounds like with Icarus, you could easily do your horror film. I'm just, I'm trying to get to be as sharp as a storyteller as possible and as thrilling and as exciting. I want to grab your attention. I don't want to let go. And I hope that that translates into everything that I do. Like I said, I do a ton of research. So like I've been throwing myself into the craft of directing. And like, I understand that the only way to really get good at it is to practice and to get out there and actually do it. But With the last two and a half years, that's been a little tough to crew up safely. So hopefully in the next couple of years, that will be something that goes forward for me. In terms of directors, female female or male or or both, uh, Mm -hmm. which director did you first not like and then you realized you enjoyed their work? Uh, I will say... I have two answers for this and they're both people that it's not that I didn't like their work. It's just that I don't think I fully appreciated them. And one of them is going to be so silly. You're just going to probably hang up on me. But (laughs) the first director I remember watching and knowing that I liked it, but not knowing why. And then as I studied it, came to learn why was David Fincher Mm -hmm. Um, and that was seven, the movie seven, which I think is brilliant. I think everything David Fincher does for the most part is brilliant. And he's got such a a voyeuristic way that he moves the camera. I really like the omniscience of this is just, I'm an observer watching these people, these terrible things happen to these people. It's not really subjective. It's just objective. That's it's this third party kind of watching these horrific things unfold. I really took to it. And the other one that I did not fully appreciate and I am so ashamed of is Steven Spielberg. As much as I'm like a horror person, I'm also extremely empathetic. It's very hard for me to watch a hardcore drama. Like I will ugly cry and I don't like to ugly cry. So when I was a kid, I saw E.T. and it really messed me up. Yes. (laughs) So I didn't really revisit Spielberg. Like, and then he, 
started doing Schindler's List and all that stuff. And it took me forever to go and revisit Jaws and mm. Close Encounters and all. And so when I revisited that, I was like, okay, so yes, this is one of the greatest directors of all time. I can learn so much from him. And like my brain melted out of my ears. Spielberg, Fincher, and Carpenter are my top three. I wish that I had a woman in there, but I have to be honest, either the women that I'm watching are not making the kind of movies that speak to me, or there just aren't that many that have been put in positions where they're able to make multiple movies where I might be able to find something that I like. It's usually like, so many women are just one and done because of any number of extenuating circumstances. I'm looking forward to finding more women that I really dig. Um, but for right now, it's Spielberg, Fincher, and Carpenter. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh, that would probably be my writing partner, John. I met him, gosh, almost 20 years ago. And I was a doofus kid. <laughs> and I had kind of floated through life. I didn't know what I wanted to be. All I knew was that the idea of sitting in a fluorescent lit cubicle for the next 40 years sounded abysmal. There was something else I was supposed to find. And he had already been writing before I met him. And when I met him and saw what he was doing, I just kind of offered to edit his stuff because I was such a huge reader anyway. I, I grew up, I was a huge reader as a kid, um, which is probably why I'm the way I am today reading Stephen King and Edgar Allan Poe when I was like six. It was through him that he was screenwriting. I said, this is fantastic. I want to learn how to do this. He was like, what are you doing in this job you're in right now? Go get an internship in New York City, work for a, a movie production company, which is how I got my first internship, how I got my first job at 20th Century Fox. Like, Without him kicking me in the butt, I don't know that I would have ever found this path. And this path is probably, I think, the only thing that would have made me happy in my life. I think I would have led one of those lives of quiet desperation had I not found writing. And I found writing because of John. So it's John. From a professional perspective, you are a screenwriter. You are also a comic writer and co-creator of some amazing comics with a very talented individual as well with Carl. And professionally, you have been in this industry for many years and you're doing extremely well from a professional standpoint. Do you consider yourself personally successful? In some aspects, yes. In other very vital aspects, no. I consider myself very successful in that the second script I ever wrote, though it took a while to get done, got made into a feature film and got put in theaters, which is more than 99% of screenwriters that are trying to make something I think can say. I've also been lucky enough to get a creator-owned book picked up at a publishing company. I've been lucky enough to get work for hire at Zenoscope. They've been wonderful to work for. Like I've been validated a lot. I get rejected every single day. I get rejected from comic pitches. I get rejected trying to sell screenplays. It is just a part of the business. It's a very large part of the business. I think that the life of a creative is one where you get successes along the way, but I don't know if you ever say, well, this is it. I'm successful now. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to finding out. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I tend to box them up. I can't let them get to me too much because if I do, I will be useless in trying to make the next thing. So I will be a little bit bummed out Maybe I'll have a little Ben and Jerry's. Maybe I'll have a little glass of wine. But I tend not to wallow because I know me and I could wallow for quite a while. And I would much rather spend my energy making the next thing that I think could succeed than kind of letting someone else's opinion of what I did get me down. Um, not everyone is going to get what you do. It doesn't mean that they're right. It doesn't mean that you're right. It just means it wasn't for them. And I 100% believe in the work that I put out. And as long as I'm happy with it, that's all that matters. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a screenwriter, a comic writer, or whatever they would like to do creatively, you may have inspired them. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would say to not be stingy in your success, especially in film. Film is so tough because people are spending millions of dollars and years of their lives on 
your work. And so when you get a modicum of success there, please reach your hand back and help someone else. Some people will not be, I don't want to say grateful, but like some people will ask more of you than they should because sometimes people get desperate. (laughs) There are good people out there. There are talented people out there who do not have your connections, your knowledge, your whatever it may be. And to get any sort of success in this business, you have to have this resiliency and this this kind of attitude that you're not going to give up. The only thing I remind myself of is the only way you fail is if you quit. And so I feel like there are people out there who get so weighed down and so bogged down by rejection. When you're just starting out, you're going to get a lot of rejections unless you're really lucky that I feel like if you can be a role model to people and say, hey, if you just keep going and you learn as much as possible and you do the work, that's the thing. Like, do the work. Don't think that because you have one web comic or one ash can or one script that you finish, that you're done, that you know what you're doing. Like, keep going. Respectfully ask those who are senior, like on Twitter. I, I see a lot of people reach out on Twitter to people who are successful. And as long as you're respectful and open to what they have to say, that's the way to do it. All I'm trying to say is stay resilient, ask for help when you need it. Don't think that you know everything um, because there's always more to learn. Even people who have reached the highest highs continue to learn and continue to grow. When you achieve that success, just hold that hand back and pull someone else up because nobody gets anywhere in these careers by themselves. Even one man band artists, writers, letters, colorists need fans to back their projects on Kickstarter. Everyone needs help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to give help. Don't give up because the only way you fail is if you quit. Because you're in, in film and comics, what is the title of your film for your life and what is the soundtrack oh goodness i think that the title of the film of my life is like i feel like the word stumbling needs to be in it (laughs) everything that i've ever done you know what it is do the hard thing anyway because everything that i have ever done in my life that has been worth anything has been the thing that has scared me the most When I graduated college, I moved down to New York City with only one friend and no job. I went up for internships that I didn't think I was going to get. I interviewed at companies I didn't think that I would be hired for, and I was because I took the chance. I moved to Los Angeles on two weeks' notice to work for a producer because I wasn't afraid to ask, but I, I got out to L.A., got in the cab to go to an apartment that I found on Craigslist. I had never met my roommate and I burst into tears because I was like, okay, here I am in Los Angeles with nobody. And it was two and a half years and it was amazing. I would say do the hard thing anyway, would be the title of my, I'm, I'm terrified to direct. I don't want to say terrified in the way that like, I won't do it, but just like stepping into anything new is always nerve wracking. You just have to do it anyway. Um, That's the only way that you get the thing that you want in this life. And You only get one of them. What's the worst that someone can say? No. Okay. So do the hard thing anyway. And I feel like because of that, the soundtrack should be like something loud and raucous. Like I I wish I had like the immigrant song playing in the background when I was doing this stuff, you know, just driving force like Thor. But yeah, it would be rock and roll. I think I grew up on rock and roll. I'm honestly not chill enough to have something like hip hop or... (laughs) It's going to be something a little bit anxiety driven, to be honest. <laughs> Loud rock and roll. That would be, that would be it. I mean, I would play the immigrant song <laughs> as you were describing your, yourself in film <laughs> yeah. format, but I think it would be a copyright strike on you. Yeah. You get so. a copyright. So you'd be like demonetized and all that stuff. Well, so. I'm already demonetized. What's the worst they can do? Shut my channel down. Oh yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do the hard thing anyway. Just, just go for it. I love it. I do hate to say this, Jenna, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You survived. Like, I yeah. survived. This was a pleasure. Honestly, it's been a blast. Oh, thanks so much. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you online, on social media, and and what else? however else we can help you? 
Sure. Uh, I am, my name is Jenna Lynn Wright. As you can see at the bottom there, I am at Jenna Lynn Wright on both Twitter and Instagram. I have a very rarely updated Substack newsletter, which is jennalynwright.substack.com. And um, yeah, the next thing out is going to be some Zenoscope stuff. So keep an eye out for that. And then Lady Mayhem, the, uh, the Kickstarter is still rolling and will be out and mailed this summer. And then, you know, keep your eyes on the trades. I'm still writing films and still pitching comics. So can't stop me. Can't stop, won't stop. But like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com and on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person, which is <laughs> youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.